But we began last week to talk about the presence of evil in our world. In this series of lessons called Avoiding Confusion, we're studying cultural issues of the day from a biblical worldview. Uh, one of those things we talked about recently was the, the sanctity of life. And Robert even spoke to that and his belief on that, and I thank God for that. Um, but today we're talking about the presence of evil. One of those questions that has always boggled the minds of people down through the generations and centuries has always been this. Why, if God is good, is there suffering and evil in the world? You know, why would a good God allow evil or allow suffering in the world? Why is there so much pain and trouble in the world? We believe that God is good, yet sometimes in our brain, because our mind is limited and finite, we find it hard to reconcile what we see in the world around us with what we know about God to be true. In this study that we began last Sunday, we're, we're following the prophet Habakkuk, who voiced this, this, this very problem. He ends up having a dialogue, a conversation with God about this problem. God, why the evil? Why the, why the injustice seemingly taking place in the world? Stephen, turn these off for me. Turn these off. From Habakkuk's conversation with God, we gain a new and hopeful perspective for this question that has perplexed people throughout the centuries. In our text verses there in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are, there are those, in other words, that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked. Again, the law is not slack, but seemingly to him he's thinking, is God not keeping his law? Why, why is not punishment coming to evildoers? Why are they seemingly getting away with what they're doing? Does, does judgment uh, never go forth? For the wicked doth compass or surround about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And Habakkuk wonders, why am I here as a righteous man? And there's people around that are just so unrighteous and they're committing so much evil and it seems like there's so much injustice taking place. God, why are you allowing it? Or why are you allowing people to get away with this? You know, I'm trying to do right, and it seems like those that are not fearing you and not doing right, they're getting away with doing whatever they want to do. God, where's the justice in that? Why is it that there's evil men, and they commit evil, and they, they do things that hurt people? People have always wondered at that question. Let's just pray, and would you ask God to help you to understand something about this this morning, okay? Father, I thank you that we have your word to look to, because I believe that the word of God is absolutely the source of truth. In a world where people try to tell us there are no absolutes, there are no right and wrong, things are not black and white, may, may Father, we not just be confused by this world. May we understand that there is absolute truth. There is a God, a creator who made us. There is a God who we're accountable to, who we will stand before one day. And Father, help us to know that right and wrong is not based on our personal uh, opinions or personal feelings. But right and wrong is, is based on the God who, who made us to be moral beings. He made us with a conscience. He made it where certain things are clearly right and good and certain things are clearly wrong. And Father, just give us some understanding through this lesson about injustice that we see and evil that we see, Lord. To understand why it is that wicked men commit evil deeds and do evil things. Our heart is always sad when people are the victim of, of some, some act of hatred or some act of, of selfishness, some act of physical abuse or taking advantage of someone. Lord, all of these things break our hearts, and God, they break your heart. It's not your will. It's not your plan. It's not your desire. But Lord, help us to understand why sinful, evil deeds are committed in the world. And Father, help us to understand that though at times it may seem like people are getting away with injustice, 
there is a judgment day coming. And Lord, there will come a day where all wrongs will be made right. Help us to see that. Father, help us to take comfort in knowing that you're still on the throne. You are still in control. And though even though sometimes, Lord, you, you use evil men to accomplish things, to bring chastening and punishment to people, even though you allow people this free will where they have the choice for what they're going to do and what they're going to say. Lord, we know you did not make us as little robots. Lord, we are accountable for our actions and our choices. And Father, you gave man a free will and man chose in that free will to disobey you. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. The whole human race was plunged into sin. We now all have a sinful nature because of that. And so we now, all of us, we sin because it's our nature, but also by our own free will, by our own choice. God, help us to understand why we have so much of the trouble that we do in our world because of the consequences of sin. Why it is that many times there's injustices because of the sinful actions and deeds of mankind. Uh, Father, we know that you, when you made this universe, you saw everything in it that it was good. Everything you, you made was good. You told us that in Genesis 1. But Lord, we have so much trouble because of the sinfulness of mankind. And Father, I'm glad that even in our sinfulness, you still love us. And you have a plan of redemption. You have a way of salvation for us. And Father, help us to understand that no matter how great our sin is, there's mercy and pardon and forgiveness with you if we'll just come to you and turn to you and put our faith in you and in your Son, Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for your great and enormous and vast love for me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Habakkuk is a unique book because it's this conversation between Habakkuk and God. We said this, number one, in our notes there, if you're filling in the blanks, number one was about the problem of evil. Habakkuk 1 and verse 1 said, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. He had this vision from God. A divine vision from God. And God was going to uh, help to show him something, to understand something about why the injustice and evil in the world. Under point number one, letter A there was Habakkuk's questions. Habakkuk's questions, if you're filling in the blank. Just like in Habakkuk's day, it doesn't take us long to recognize a world full of evil and wrongdoing. There are so many acts of hatred and violence to take place in our world, and there's greed and there's selfishness, and there's so many things that are the consequences of sin. When we encounter the suffering of our world, we may question, how can a good and loving and all-powerful and all-knowing God be okay with this? We even gave an example last week of Epicurus and some of the things that he said, just really questioning God. Questioning God. May I say that God is still good in spite of some of the evil and suffering and pain that there is in this world. You know, God himself, he never does evil towards people, right? We have trouble in the world. We have evil in the sense that we have trouble in our world. And we have the consequences of sin. And we have great suffering and pain that comes because of the sinfulness of mankind and the choices of mankind. But God is never up there with some vendetta against you just, just seeking to, to do you evil, to, to, to try to hurt you or harm you or to do you wrong. God is holy and righteous and perfect. So there's never something that he could do towards you that would just be him in, in selfishness. Or him in unkindness just wanting to destroy you. Now because God is just and holy and perfect. There are times that in his justice he does bring just judgment. You see judgment is only just and right if God gives people what is fair. What is equitable. What they deserve right. Would God still be good? Would God still be holy? Would God still be righteous if he allowed people to just uh, sin and do evil and there was no consequences for sin? If wrong could be done and there was no justice, well, he, he wouldn't be just any longer. Sometimes, though, justice doesn't come on our timetable. 
we may look at the evil around us and people doing wrong around us and we wonder, where's the justice? Or especially when it gets real personal, that's when it really bothers us, right? Wait a minute, God, somebody hurt me. Somebody wronged me. Where's the justice, God? Aren't you going to punish them? That tends to get us the most upset when injustice happens to us and somebody hurts us, somebody wrongs us. And we wonder, God, won't you punish them? May I say, because God is holy and righteous and because he is a just judge, one day everyone will be judged. I'm so glad that when it comes to my sins, my sins were already judged and the penalty paid for. The punishment was made on the cross of Calvary. And the truth is, the punishment was made for all men's sins on the cross of Calvary. You know, the only one who one day will have to stand before God at what we call the great right throne judgment and take their own punishment for their sins are those who have rejected God and rejected God's Son, Jesus Christ. Because you know what? The God of the Bible, the God of heaven, our creator, he has made a way of salvation and escape for every one of us. He actually let his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, he sent him from heaven down to earth to die on the cross of Calvary. To take the punishment for sinful men and women and boys and girls so that we wouldn't have to be punished for our sins. To all who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll accept him. He's your personal savior. You can know my sins are forgiven. My sins are erased from off of my record. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Corinthians that, that Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, he actually became sin for us. He was taking all of our sins upon himself when he died on the cross of Calvary. You want to talk about injustice? There has never been a greater injustice than the fact that God's son, Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for our sins. He was innocent. He had done nothing wrong. Uh, Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Nothing wrong with him. Why then was Jesus crucified and killed on a tree just outside Jerusalem? It was for the sins of mankind. It was for the sins of the world. You see, Jesus knew even 2,000 years ago that one day Brian Johnston would need a Savior. He knew that I'd be a sinner and I would need my sins to be forgiven. And he knew there'd be no other way of escape for me unless he came and took the punishment for my sins. If he didn't do that for me, I'd have to stand before God and take the punishment for my sins. That would only be just. That would only be right. But you see, because God is both perfectly holy and righteous and also a just judge, knowing that sin must be punished, but that he is also a loving and merciful, kind God, long-suffering and patient and wanting to redeem us, wanting to save us, wanting to bring us to himself. That's why God was able to satisfy his righteousness, satisfy his holiness, satisfy his justice by letting sin be punished and paid for through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. But then he can make salvation freely available to you. You don't have to buy your way into heaven. You don't have to work your way into heaven. You don't have to do penance or think, I've got to spend my whole life doing all these good works to somehow maybe do more good than bad so that I can maybe do enough to please God so that he might forgive my sins and accept me. No, God accepted the sacrifice of his only begotten son. Jesus Christ was the sacrifice for you and for me. He died on the cross. He took the punishment for our, our sins. I'm glad that the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, he's not like some other gods. He's not there just wanting to destroy. No, he's there. Yes, he's just. And yes, he's righteous. And yes, he's holy. But as a loving, merciful God, he's ready to pardon you. He's ready to forgive you. In fact, he wants to. And he's longing for you to just come to him and be willing to believe in him. Be willing to believe in his son, Jesus Christ, that he left heaven and came to earth, took the punishment for your sins to be your savior. Go on to the next slide there, if you would. Brother Paul, thank you for helping me with that. 
So we have a wonderful God who loves us with great amazement, great wonder, and He longs for you. Even though we're sinners, He longs for you to have salvation. He suffered the greatest injustice ever. You, you think God doesn't understand suffering? Oh yes, He does. He suffered for us. You think Jesus doesn't understand you? No. Like, like some of those, ad, those ads they've created for Super Bowls and different things. He gets us. I don't know if I like all the ads. I haven't really seen them. But God does get you. He understands you. May I say He understands suffering and pain. Jesus suffered for you. He died for you so that you might have the forgiveness of your sins. How wonderful it is. That even though we've done wrong, we've sinned against God, He will bring forgiveness to us. He'll save us if we'll only come to Him. Letter B then, our notes was this, Habakkuk's hopelessness. Habakkuk's hopelessness. Habakkuk not only wondered how long, but he followed it up with the question, How long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? It's quite an accusation against God, isn't it? God, are you not listening to me? God, how long am I going to cry unto you and you not hear me in my pain, my crying out to you? Habakkuk wasn't the first person to do this or the last person to do this. And the psalmist said in Psalm 13, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide my face from me? There's been other times when people have been going through suffering and pain that they just wondered, God, do you not hear me? Do you not hear me? Sometimes the answer doesn't always come like we want it to or when we want it to. But God hasn't forsaken you. Go to the next slide there. What, what Habakkuk didn't understand is that God's silence is not evidence of his absence. God's silence is not evidence of his ab absence. There in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, the Bible says, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, notice this, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. They were in slavery down there in Egypt. When they were in a difficult time, did God hear their cry? Yes, He did. God loved them and God cared about them. And God was going to raise up Moses to be a deliverer, to bring them out of slavery in Egypt and bring them to the land that years before he had promised to Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make of you a great nation. God did that, didn't he? God always hears the cries of his people. Exodus 3 and verse 7 says this. Next slide there, Paul. Exodus 3, 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. We said last week that evil can be divided into two categories, natural evil and moral evil. Natural evil and moral evil. There's natural evil that are things that come as consequences and so on. But there's also, uh, there's also moral evil. Moral evil. Moral evil is when God, because He gave man a free choice and a free will, where sometimes man, in their conscience, doesn't do what is moral, doesn't do what is right, doesn't do what is good, but sometimes chooses to do what is immoral, chooses to do what is evil, chooses to do what is selfish, chooses to do something that is just a fulfillment maybe of their own lust. You know, why is it that people steal and rob and, and commit murder or commit rape or different things? Why? Because they're selfish and they're just fulfilling their own lusts. They're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. They're fulfilling the lust of the eyes. Why, why do people covet and take things that are not theirs? Well, because they see something somebody else has and in their sinfulness and in their selfishness. They go and steal it. They go and uh, take something from their neighbor's property. You know, all the sin in the world is because we, we are moral creatures. We are moral beings. We do have a conscience. We do have the ability to make the choices of doing what is right or doing what is wrong. Doing what is good. Doing what is evil. And sadly, we see so many times we, of course, make the choices that are, are, are morally evil. Morally wrong. Morally indecent. And how sad that is. Second thing I want you to see in your notes there is this. The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. God is still sovereign. God is still in control. I want you to know how much God loves you. 
knowing that we would sin and knowing from the beginning that Jesus Christ would be despised and rejected, he still loved us enough to carry out his plan of sacrifice. Jesus Christ endured suffering to save us from our sin. So I already said, God had predetermined even before the foundation of the world that he would send his son to be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, like a lamb sacrifice the Jewish people would make then, uh, as regularly to make atonement for their sin, Jesus Christ would become the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible describes him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was crucified. His blood was shilled, shed. He was killed there on the cross of Calvary. Why? To take the punishment for my sins, to atone for my sins, so I could have the remission of my sins, my sins remitted, the payment's been made, and now my sins are gone from my record. Gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Why? Because Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. Praise the Lord for that. God gets us. God understands suffering. He experienced it for us so that we could have salvation. Letter A in our notes there, this is where we stopped last week, is the providence of God. The providence of God. Sometimes when we talk about God's sovereignty, we talk about His providence. And the word providence comes from the Latin word providere. If you break that word into its prefix and its root, you have the word providere. Pro means ahead, videre means to see. To see ahead. It's also the word that we would end up getting our English word video from. A video. <laughs> Providere means to see beforehand. It means that prior to it, you actually get to see it. Some foresight. You've seen it before. God's providence, though, is actually more than just this de definition gives us. It is more than just simply foresight or seeing things ahead of time. Next slide there, if you would. God's providence means that He pre previews or sees ahead, and he also provides for what will come. God sees ahead, and God knows what is coming in our lives, and he will provide what we need in that time if we will seek him. God's providence is a combination of his sovereignty, or his rule, and his, his foreknowledge. We could say that God not only sees ahead how everything will fit together, but God actually plans for it all to fit together. It was this providence that God drew Habakkuk's attention to in answer to Habakkuk's you know, accusations or charges against God. God, do you not see? Do you not hear? Do you not know what's going on? And Habakkuk is, is accusing God. But God tries to bring Habakkuk's attention to the fact that God has some foreknowledge and God sees. And yes, there are times where God allows certain things into our lives, but it's always for his glory and it's always for our good. Do you know that even if sometime a little bit of chastening had to come into your life, it's for your good? It's for your good? You know, we live in a pretty messed up world that really says you should just let children go up, th growing up, thinking whatever they want to think, doing whatever they want to do. They're their own master. They can just decide for themselves based on their own feelings what's good and what's right. And whatever's right and good is whatever's right for me. Whatever is good for me. Does civilization function very well if everybody does just what's good for me? Just what's right for me? Just what's best for me? No. We're to consider our neighbor, aren't we? We're to love our neighbor. I restrain myself from some things. Why? Because I don't just live according to what's good for me. Right? Right means I live with an accountability to God. Right means I, I, I'm going to treat my neighbor a certain way. Right? Scriptures teach us where to love God with all of our heart. Scriptures teach us where to love our neighbor as ourself. We don't get to just live life and I can do whatever I want, whatever is good for me. No. We live based on what's right according to God's, God's rules, if you will, God's laws. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, 
for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. God responded to all of Habakkuk's questions and doubts by telling him that he was about to work a work. He was about to do something that would be beyond Habakkuk's ability to believe, even if God told him about it ahead of time. You know, what are the works of God? They are the result of God exercising His sovereignty. In Psalm 111, verses 2 and 3, it says, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that a pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious. The reference here is to God's first recorded work in Scripture, and that being the work of creation. If you visit the Cavendish uh, Physics Laboratory in Cambridge, England, you'll find this sentence inscribed above the door. It's a Latin translation of the verse there in Psalm 11, uh, 111, verse 2. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. You know, God's amazing work in creation is not only the foundation for understanding science and things in this amazing creation, but it's also the foundation for understanding all of God's wonderful works, all of God's glorious works. There must be a willingness to seek out God because everything He does is glorious and wonderful. And He's trying to accomplish His works in our lives. Go to the next slide. God's work in creation helps to give us context for suffering. The Bible tells us that God's original design was very good. Remember in reading in Genesis, God created this and said that it is good. God made this on the second day and said, it is good. Third day, it is good. After all of his creation, he looked back and said, boy, it's, it's very good. It's very good. Next slide there. Sin did not originate with God. And its consequences were not His original plan. But God does allow us personal choice. God knew, of course, the choice that Adam and Eve would make. But He made them with a free will. He knew the choice that they would make. And that's why He already had it in His plan that I'm going to send Jesus to be their Savior. They're going to sin against me and, and break fellowship with me and break off that relationship with me. I'm going to make a way so that they can come back into a relationship with me. They can be born again. They can experience new life, new birth, and have a relationship with God their Creator. So sin did not originate with God, and it's his con its consequences were not His original plan, but God does allow us personal choice. One man said this, God is not the, the, the author of evil as far as sinful choices and so on. Neither, however, is He ever the victim of evil. Go to the next slide there. Oh, you already got it. Thanks, Paul. You're ahead of me. Evil, evil entered the universe through Satan. Moral evil and so on, right? We understand it entered the universe through Satan and temptation coming and the immoral choice that Adam and Eve made. It would be misleading for us to say that God created Satan. Rather, we know from the scriptures that God created Lucifer. Lucifer was a beautiful being who lived in heaven, one of the archangels of God. It seems to be that he led the music in heaven. The prophet Ezekiel described what a perfect being Lucifer was in the state that God created him. Ezekiel 28, 15 says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. When Lucifer rebelled against God, his created state was lost, and he was cast out from heaven, becoming who we refer to as Satan, or the devil. And it was he who tempted Adam and Eve with sin there in the Garden of Eden. The Bible tells us this in Genesis 3 and verse 1. You got it in your Bible, or maybe in your handout. Genesis 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle. He was very sneaky, very deceptive. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What, when Satan brought the temptation of evil into the perfect garden of Eden, Adam and Eve fell prey to lustful desires. And their act of disobedience to God brought sin into the world and corrupt, corrupted that which God had made perfect. Did God make Adam and Eve perfect in the garden of Eden perfect? Yes, He did. 
But, but Satan came in the form of that serpent and tempted them to do wrong, tempted them to disobey God. And the choice they made was what caused them then to do what was immoral, to do what was wrong, to sin against God. You see, God's original design was good. But Adam, mankind's representative, first representative, sinned against God. The Bible tells us there in Romans 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Why did God even allow for the possibility of sin? We might want to ask, think that, you know. Why did God allow for it? Right? And some of you have asked me that before. Why didn't God just make Adam and Eve that they wouldn't even be capable of sinning? You'll have to ask him that one day. But I know that God is glorified. And that in this wonderful true story called the Bible, the Word of God, God who created us, created, created us beautiful and wonderful and amazing. There was nothing ugly in his creation. Nothing sinful in his creation. He, though, gave us a free will, a free choice. And you know why I tell people sometimes why I think he made us with a free will? is because God is a spirit. He wants us to worship him right in spirit and truth. God is a trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has personality, has feelings. He is capable of love and so on. I think God created us with just a total free will rather than creating us all as robots so that we would be able to respond to his love from our heart and choose to love him. You know, what love and feeling would there be in it if God just made us robots that everything we just did was because he made us a certain way? But no, God made us such that you can from your heart choose to believe in Him or reject Him. You can choose to love Him or you could choose to say, I hate Him, I want nothing to do with Him. It's your choice, isn't it? And to a God who understands love, a God who is love, the Bible says, He made it so that if we choose Him, it's from our heart, not that it's forced. I tell the, the Muslim people that I meet, the God of the Bible is not forcing you to believe in Him. I don't have some religion that I can cram down your throat. It's not something I can force on you. I tell them, I'm not going to twist your arm and throw you up against the wall and force you to believe in the God of the Bible, force you to become a Christian. No, if you're going to choose to believe in my God that I believe in and the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, it's going to be because you from your heart choose to believe in Him. I can't force it on you. God doesn't force it on you. You've got to choose Him from your heart. You choose to accept Him. Why did God even allow for the possibility of sin? Because He granted mankind a free will. God did not create sin, but He did create us with a conscience and the ability to choose. Since God created us for a relationship with Him, He did not create us as robots. For while there would be no sin without a free will, there would also be no love and feeling. In fact, if we look back to the reality that no system of belief can fully explain the presence of evil, it is also worth noting that no system of belief apart from God can fully explain the presence of good. You know, no belief system, whether you believe in God or whether you say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. None of us, none can just fully explain the evil in the world. But you can't explain the good in the world without God. Without God. While we do live in a world that has evil in it, we also live in a world that even though it's in a fallen sinful condition, has much good in it too. There's much good in it. Why is there some people that just love like they do? It's because they've got God's love in them. Why is there some people that know how to forgive and be kind? It's because they've learned from God how to forgive. The virtues that we admire the most are not possible without the existence of God. So why does a good God allow evil? 
we may never fully be able to understand the answer to that this side of eternity. But we do know that a better day is coming. Romans 8 tells us that everything in creation and everything within us groans for God's restored good creation. You see it there in your handout, Romans 8, 22 and 23, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and, and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Quickly here, just look at letter B. The character of God. The character of God. After God told Habakkuk that he was going to do a marvelous work in the saving of Israel, he went on to explain a little bit of his plan. The Bible says there in Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth or the width of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. In other words, God told Habakkuk, you're right. Israel shouldn't get away with the violence and injustice and evil. So I'm actually going to raise up Babylon to take God's people captive. I'm going to allow this trouble to come to Israel. Why? Because they've been turning their heart away from me so much. They've been forsaken the God of Israel. They've been turning their back on me. So I'm going to raise up Babylon and allow them to come in. And yeah, they're going to bring some trouble. Yeah, they're going to bring some evil upon Israel. But it's so that they might turn their hearts back to me. Because to know me and follow me and love me, that's the way that you'll be a blessed nation. That's the way that you'll be a blessed people. Is there some times where God allows some trouble or evil in the world because he's trying to get his people to repent, to turn to him? Absolutely. He wants to shake us and get our attention. You know, how has God ever wronged us? How has God ever hurt us? He never has. Sometimes people go adrift. They go astray. Prone to wander. God sometimes does bring some things as a measure of chastening that we might turn our hearts back to Him. Habakkuk seems to get really confused at what God is saying. His first complaint was that God was letting people get, get away with doing evil. Now he hears that God is actually going to use the Babylonians to execute His justice upon Israel. Upon them. And Habakkuk protests that. He says there in verse 13, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and, and, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon uh, that, them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Go to the next slide there. Habakkuk didn't understand how God, who is holy and pure, could use evil to accomplish his purposes. The truth is that God, in his amazing sovereignty, can use even evil to bring about good. Do you know the story of Joseph? Some of you know that in the Bible. He was hated. He was envied. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was sold into slavery. Even then, down in Egypt, he was, he was wrongly accused. He was imprisoned and he was forgotten about. Yet God revealed that there was a greater purpose in all of that suffering that Joseph went through and that Joseph endured. God put Joseph down there in bondage in Egypt for just the right time when God was going to exalt Joseph, bring him out of prison, and let him be the deliverer for his people, the deliverer for his nation. He would save them in a time of famine. God would give Joseph great wisdom and great favor down there in Egypt that he would become a deliverer, really, for the world. You see, God had a plan. God had a purpose. And it seemed for a while, Joseph probably wondered, is God forgetting about me? No, God wasn't forgetting. God had a greater purpose. In Genesis 50 there in verse 20, it says, But as for you, Joseph, speaking to his brothers who hated him, sold him into slavery. But as for you, my brothers, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Have you ever in the middle of some time of suffering or difficulty or trial in your life thought, I just can't see the good in this. How is there any good in this? Just because you maybe in that moment cannot see the good. Or I can't see a reason doesn't mean that a reason doesn't exist. 
As believers, we, we take great comfort in that promise of Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Sometimes in our pain, we think that Habakkuk thought, why doesn't God care? The truth is this, God does care. God does care. And God is going to do something. God is going to do something. The Bible tells us two responses that God has uh, to our suffering. The first is that He executes just judgment. He does what is just. God always executes judgment and justice because that is a part of His holy nature. In Psalm 149 and verse 9 there, the Bible says, To execute upon them the judgment written, this honor have all His saints. Praise you, the Lord. What Habakkuk wanted, though, is what we all want. We want God to execute judgment now. Now. We want immediate justice. And sometimes it seems like it's, it's not coming as quickly as we want it. There are times when God allows evil and wickedness to continue seemingly unchecked because of His patience and long-suffering. But there will be a time when God calls all men to, all men to repentance. You know, we would like to complain sometimes. Boy, I, I wish we had better politicians. I, I wish we had a more honest prime minister. I wish we had this or that. You know, sometimes God doesn't always give us what we want. He gives us what we deserve. Have we as a nation rejected God? Do we as a nation, do we fear God like we should? Do we do, have we, have we lived in such a way that we deserve God's blessing? Why do we face sometimes some of the oppression and opposition to good that we seemingly face? The Bible tells us in Acts 17, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, to turn to Him. In, the chap in chapter 2 of Habakkuk, God assures His prophet that He does see the evil and He will judge it. He specifically mentions greed and injustice and violence and drunkenness and idolatry. No evil will ever be committed without God being aware of it. And no evil will ever be unaccounted for by God. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14 it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We can always trust that God will execute judgment against evil. And it may not be on our timetable, but it will always happen. So God always executes just judgment. And lastly, He enters into our brokenness. In our brokenness, in our pain, He enters in to try to help us. The whole theme of the Scriptures is God's plan of redemption. It's the story of God who created a perfect world, but then sin corrupted that world. And then Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, He entered into our broken, sinful world to bring us redemption, to restore us to God, to bring healing and pardon and forgiveness of sins, to bring us back to God. Jesus understands suffering. In Hebrews 4.15 it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be tempted, uh, touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus came and He took upon Himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus understands suffering. He suffered for you and for me. Don't, don't miss this truth. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is God's answer to the evil in the world. People so often ask, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? Can I be real honest with you? The truth is that there's only really ever been one time that that happened. And he volunteered for it. There was only one time where truly something bad and evil and awful happened to somebody who was perfectly good and holy and righteous. And that was what happened to Jesus. The injustice that he suffered. Innocent, clean, perfect. But he suffered for our sins. 
Why do bad things happen? We may not fully know, but we do know why not. It's not because God doesn't love us. He does love us. And He loves us so much that He chose to come down to us in our suffering, in our sinfulness, and to suffer with us, to suffer for us, so we could have salvation and forgiveness. Nobody loves you like God loves you. Nobody loves you like He loves you. And I hope that you'll come to know Him. Let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand about this good and amazing and awesome God creator who made us, who loves us, who made us with a free will and ability to make choices. God, we see so sadly that in the state of a fallen, sinful, broken world, there's a lot of evil choices that are made. There's a lot of selfish, sinful, hurtful choices that are made. And God, there is a lot of suffering and pain and trouble as the, even the consequences of, of sin. Sometimes we experience ourselves because of people's sin against us. Sometimes other people experience it because we've sinned against them. Sometimes we live with the great frustration because of just the, the evil, sinful choices of people all around us in the world and just seemingly how much more evil and wicked and corrupt our world is becoming. But God, may we understand that no one is ever truly going to get away with it. You are a just judge. You will execute just judgment. And one day, those that are seemingly getting away with evil and wickedness in our world, you will judge them for it. You will punish them for it. But Father, may we also see ourselves in this picture that though we may like to look at others and say, boy, they are so wicked and they are so evil and what they're doing is so awful, may we understand that, that we too have committed evil. We too have committed sins. We too have hurt other people. We've, we've committed many injustices. Father, help us to understand that the greatest injustice ever was your son dying and taking the punishment for our sins. May you help us to truly grasp and understand how much you love us. You want us to have the forgiveness of sins. You understand our hurt and pain. You understand it so much you suffered and took pain and punishment for us so we wouldn't have to. Father, if someone does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would come to you and trust in you because only through you can they be born again and have this new birth and receive the gift of salvation.